Thank you for joining us today for Pacific Historic Park series, History Talks, brought to you in partnership with Edutainment Learning. Today, our featured guest is National Park Service Chief Historian Daniel Martinez, and he will provide us an inside look into the specialized weapons developed specifically for the attack on Pearl Harbor. Okay, so I hope you enjoy it. Go ahead, Daniel, when you are ready. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this program, and we'll get started right away. The program today is uh, one that I've wanted to do for a long time. It's about the special specialized weapons used at Pearl Harbor. And over the years, we've been asked a lot of questions about how it was done and the way it was done. And I think this program may answer a lot of your questions. So we'll get started with the first slide. Today, the USS Arizona rests underneath the memorial that honors the men that died that day. The death of this battleship was due to the specialized weapon that was developed by the Japanese Imperial Navy. In the outbreak of the war, they would use three special weapons. The one that was so dynamic was the aerial bomb, and we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Next slide. The battleship Arizona was really the last formal portrait that we know of was taken in 1941, late 1941, when she was in Bremerton. And this is how she appeared on the day of December 7th. The only thing different about her, it would be that she would be in a, a measure ca uh, camouflage, darker gray with light gray tops. But this is what she looked like. Next slide. This is the USS Utah Memorial on the other side of Ford Island, almost exactly opposite of the USS Arizona Memorial. And this is the remains of the USS Utah that was sunk that day by the Japanese Navy and her memorial. Next picture. This is the USS Utah also in Bremerton about the same time. She was going to be leaving for Pearl Harbor shortly, but she also would be addressed with her war colors or camouflage as she headed back to Hawaii. Next slide. Often asked the road to Pearl Harbor, how did it take place? Probably there was no act greater uh, in the uh, panorama of the oncoming war than this treaty that was signed between Germany, Italy, and Japan, known as the Tripartite Pact. It was signed in September 1940, nearly a year plus uh, from the Pearl Harbor attack. Next slide. This treaty, when it was signed, now made Japan part of the Axis powers. The man you see at the microphone is one of the diplomats that will be in, J in Washington, D.C. His name is Kurusu, and he'll be in Washington, D.C. at the time of the attack in Par Pearl Harbor, negotiating with the Secretary of State of the United States, Cordell Hull. And he will be absolutely embarrassed because his country has not t told him that the attack will take place. And so those diplomats, Nomura and Caruso, will be sacrificed and disgraced in Washington. Next slide. This is the actual document that they signed, and this sealed the fate of Pearl Harbor because the United States now would encourage a number of, of, of uh, bands of oil and scrap metal and Japan will see that when they put the embargo on it as an act of war and then we'll move quickly to develop a plan to cause uh, the outbreak of the war. Next slide. These images are were in Japan at the time. These were one's a postcard, one's a poster, and the other is a a uh, button that would be worn, and this was celebrating the tripartite pact. It's interesting with the poster, you see a samurai warrior slashing down on the Pacific fleet with the banners of Germany, Japan, and Italy behind it. It gives you an idea of the temperament of the militarists in Japan at that time. Next slide. This event sealed uh, the f really the fate of Pearl Harbor. The raid on Toronto that took place on the 11th and 12th of 1940 
was from this carrier uh, and uh, and what happened this carrier you see here is the ark royal the carrier that's like this is the illustrious that will carry out the raid next slide the idea of this uh, uh, attack was a very difficult one because they had to develop a shallow water torpedo for the the base at toronto to give you a background on the base it's the italian base at Toronto is the naval base. It's where the Italian fleet is. The Italian fleet is located, if you were looking at a map of Italy, you would look down at the bottom of the boot, uh, kind of on the inside of that towards the Mediterranean, and then kind of the curvature of the heel is where the Toronto Harbor was for the Italian fleet. It's important also to note that that fleet threatened the British as they continued their operations in the Mediterranean, in, in particular supporting their troops in North Africa against the Germans. So it was always a threat. And the British were very wary to go out there because the Italians had a number of battleships and cruisers, and these were formidable ships, and they needed to figure out an idea how to deal with them so they could not, you know, threatened their shipping. They developed a shallow water torpedo, and this is one of the tests that's going on. And you can see the aircraft is a, called a fairy swordfish aircraft. And this aircraft is on the aircraft carrier. It's very nimble, very light, and they have developed a new system for dropping torpedoes in shallow water. The harbor at uh, Toronto is only 35 feet deep. Next slide. This is the harbor right there. I want to give you an idea of the kind of things that are, that'll be formidable there. Besides the depth of the water, the harbor defense includes a 90, uh, 193 machine guns, over 22 uh, anti-aircraft guns, and also barrage balloons. So, and a, 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 about 30 uh, searchlights. So this harbor is well protected. So a barrage balloon, for those of you who don't know, you've seen them in the movies and in some photos, these are lethal. And what happens is these barrage balloons hang wires from them. So if you fly underneath a barrage balloon in a plane like the Ferry Swordfish, it'd be shredded by that and knock the aircraft down. The British are aware of all of these defenses and you can see around the harbor there are are a number of things there. They also had anti-torpedo nets, but the anti-torpedo nets were so kind of sluggish and difficult, they didn't put them up. And the, the uh, depth of that was only about 16 to 18 feet. So the torpedo could actually go underneath it if they needed to. Next slide. The attack took place at night and that attack uh, it was uh, must have been incredible to to uh, witness it this is a illustration of that what happened in order to make sure at night and they took off from their carriers at 10 o'clock that night and arrived over target around 12 that these um these barrage balloons were a problem uh, all the other obstacles they had of even seeing the ships is a problem so they had a, uh, planes assigned two of them to fly over the harbor and drop flares and it lit it up like daylight and the torpedo planes now came in at a low altitude and began launching torpedoes which you can see going through the water as kind of a straight white line next slide when the torpedo was dropped they had figured out a way to to drop a shallow water torpedo i should mention to you torpedoes of the day needed a, would need at least 90 feet of water before they could then come up and level off. The British did two things. They needed to make this aircraft uh, nimble enough to make the, the range of where the ships are. So they took out these, this plane had three seats in it. They had a pilot, an observer, and a rear gunner. The observer's position, they put in a fuel tank. They could order about 70 gallons of fuel. And then the aircraft was adjusted so that at the nose of the aircraft, just, just past the engine, was a big drum and a spool of wire. When the torpedo was dropped, the wire would be attached to the torpedo. And as the wire 
got to a, a length of about, oh, 20 some feet, the tension of that wire would be strained by the drop of the torpedo and it would snap. This would allow the torpedo to not go nose in, but as you see, go flat, do a belly flop on the water, breaking the fall so that the torpedo doesn't plunge to that depth and now could run in about 25 to 30 feet of water or let probably closer rather to 20 to 25 feet and run towards the target. Next slide. This is the result of, of that uh, sinking of one of the, uh, the Italian battleships. Next slide. When the Toronto raid was over, we had, the British had sunk one battleship, damaged two battleships, slightly damaged two cruisers and destroyers. And the planes that were lost were only two. Next slide. This is one of the interesting planners. You see a very serious man there. Here's his background. He's a commander of the Japanese Navy, fighter pilot, planner of the attack, developer of a strategic airstrike, which is another name for surprise attack, and advocates special weapons development. When I was preparing for this um, paper, I found out and long ago that the Japanese didn't do this without the backdrop of what had happened at Toronto. They sent uh, one of the Japanese officers went from Germany down to Japan, down to Toronto to observe what had happened and reported back to Admiral Yamamoto, who was in charge of the Japanese Navy at that time and reported that they had pulled it off. Somehow they had figured out how to drop shallow water torpedo in less than 35 feet of water. That had a big imprint on this gentleman you see here. He now knows and others that share the same idea of the possibility of an attack on Pearl Harbor, that it can be done, but they don't know how it was done. Next slide. And this is their target. This is a Pearl Harbor, the Gibraltar, the Pacific, as it was called uh, by one of the magazines, uh, popular at that time, Collier's. And this, um, this is Pearl Harbor. In the center, you see Ford Island. And over to the, just at the bottom of the photograph is the Naval Shipyard. This is also, uh, as you look, you can see a body of water that's off to your right. And that will be the avenue of approach for the battleships right here, right on that dark, dark area and just a little lower. And that will be right there. That will be the southeast lock in which they will approach uh, the battleships on Battleship Row, which are lined along the side of Fort Island. Next slide. This change of command ceremony that took place uh, at 10 a.m. in uh, early uh, January uh, was the, the, the thing that really uh, kind of set the stage for who would be in charge of the Pacific Fleet, how would they protect this Pacific Fleet. And um, this is what he said is in his, uh, this is, and the person I'm talking about is, Admiral Husband E. Kimmel, who assumes command from Ab Admiral Richardson and now has the, you know, the responsibility for the proficiency of the fleet and its preparedness. I can only say this, that I shall, it shall be my personal motto to gain, rather to maintain the fleet at the highest level of efficiency and preparedness. Historians still argue whether that was achieved. Admiral Kimmel will be the one that will have the the majesty of command, and also the responsibility for what happens at Pearl Harbor. Next slide. Admiral Kimmel is an affable guy. He can be, uh, at times, he can be very, very tough. He's a very uh, efficient officer. He's a quite capable officer, and uh, he's proved it in his early career, Annapolis graduate. Uh, Admiral Kimmel is a good choice as many thought at that time for the Pacific Fleet. Next slide. His counterpart also comes to uh, Hawaii in January of 1941. This is General Walter Short. 
and he will be uh, his command headquarters is not on the is not at uh, as some people thought at uh, at a, another base. He's actually at Fort Shafter. And at Fort Shafter, he commands all Army and land and air forces for the Hawaii Department. That means everything on the islands, uh, island of Oahu and the outer islands is his responsibility for the defense. These two commands are supposed to work conjunctly together. And that's the responsibility for both commands to work together for the defense of Oahu. Next slide. This is Oahu. And for those of you unfamiliar with it, we'll have the little arrow point out that you can see where Pearl Harbor is, right towards the bottom of the map, and that is where the Pacific Fleet will be. If you go up towards Schofield Barracks and Wheeler Field, that is the main fighter base for the Army. There's an auxiliary field above it called Holly Eva Field, and then coming down towards, back to Pearl Harbor, is the main bomber base at Hickam Field. The Navy also has air stations at Kaneohe, Naval, Kaneohe Bay Naval Air Station and a Naval Air Station on Ford Island. The Marines have an airfield at Eva Mooring Mass Field or Eva Field Auxiliary Base. So now you can see the kind of defenses. There's also mention of radars when we had talked about that earlier, but this is the Japanese target. They are not just going to go after Pearl Harbor but they're going after all the, all the defenses that could possibly could get in their way. Take the eyes of the fleet away from the Americans by striking them at Kaneohe Bay and Ford Island where the uh, Pearl Harbor Naval Air Station is. Take their fighter base out at Wheeler Field, suppress that so they can't get up to defend themselves. Also strike at, at Bellows Field, also strike at Hickam Field also strike at EVA. The idea of the Japanese military thought at this time is to suppress the entire island so that Americans cannot respond. And within 20 minutes of the attack, when it takes place, air power ceased to exist in Hawaii. Next slide. This is a, a, a picture taken in uh, October of 1941 that gives you an idea of uh, on Oahu that doesn't exist anymore because you can see the spaces that are empty. That's the Koalau mountain range. And uh, that mountain range runs all the way past Waikiki. You can see the harbor entrance. You can see the runways for Hickam Field. And then off to your left, you can see the Naval Station at Pearl Harbor and the outer edge of Ford Island. Next. This gives you a little more detail. This illustration will give you an idea of, from a kind of a pilot's point of view, of Pearl Harbor and Ford Island, where the Naval Air Station for Pearl Harbor is. You can see the in the all the gray areas are military uh, structures. Hickam Field is below. You can see the runway right there on Ford Island, and then if you'll bring, bring out down towards the bottom, that's Battleship Row right there on Ford Island, right there. And then you can see the Southeast Lock right across it. Now the Japanese planes, and we'll show you this in a moment, runs in, in that area. Now these special weapons that we're talking about have to overcome all these obstacles. And what are those? Well, we'll point them out in a second, but think about it. If you are an aviator, how are you gonna fly down there? Go through the Southeast Lock or the opposite side of Ford Island, get down to 30 feet, within 10 seconds, get your aircraft in the attitude to drop the torpedo, probably were taking incoming fire, then rise up after you drop your torpedo and fly over the ships. How do you keep all of that in concert? Well, the Japanese figured out a way to make sure all the planes attacked in a pattern that would eliminate perhaps even mid-air collisions. Next slide. One of the things that we the, the Americans had to deal with is they had a consulate here in, in Honolulu. And that consulate is a picture of today's consulate, which is, we have very good friendships with now. But at the time there was a, another building and that's where a Japanese naval spy came to Oahu for the purpose of scouting out all of these attack areas 
that I have, have um, talked about in the previous slide. Next. He came uh, via this uh, ship, which made regular calls, passenger ship, cargo ship, to Honolulu Harbor. This is the Tayumaru. Next slide. The, the, the uh, Naval Intelligence Officer, there's a picture here that is over, that is not the officer, and somehow the slide is doubled, but behind that picture is Kazu Sakamaki. So um, he, uh, the, 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 that was the gentleman that was in the, the, the uh, submarine that w and would be later captured as America's first prisoner of war. Now this, this intelligence officer started observing from the heights above Pearl Harbor, the Pacific Fleet, making note of the carriers here, the battleships here, the coming and going. He also would go about the island observing the airfields. He'd rent an airplane and be a tourist and fly around, snap some pictures, and he studied the Pacific Fleet. There was nobody that was more competent in doing this than this particular intelligence officer. Next slide. This is the Pacific Fleet in its war colors taken in just before the attack on Pearl Harbor. There's something very interesting about this. In order to maybe uh, eliminate uh, their uh, visibility, they paint them dark gray to blend in with the sea. The, the tops of these battleships are light gray to blend in with the sky. And in this particular case, in the Oklahoma and the Nevada, you see the false bow wave on it. And that's meant to, if anybody's firing at the sh ships at distance, this bow wave uh, indicates a speed. That's how they could do that sometimes. And the, they're standing still, but this looks like it's moving over 20 knots. Next slide. Special weapons. The first one was going to be uh, dealing with how do you attack these battleships that moor side by side in Pearl Harbor. The outboard ships will be susceptible to torpedo attack, but the inboard ships wouldn't be susceptible to that. The only way to deal with them is through using bombs. You can see that even if you strike the battleship and just close, you can cause damage. A near miss can cause damage. And of course, a direct hit has its own, own uh, capabilities. And in this case, the Japanese trained exhaustively to make sure that they could get the torpedo in. And by doing so, um, get it at the right level, the right speed, and execute. The horizontal bombers, they trained them to drop uh, high-level bombs at an altitude of anywhere from nine to 10,000 feet. So this gives you an idea of the vulnerability of a ship. Next slide. This is what they developed. This is the finished product. The Japanese named it the Thunderfish. And you can see uh, this torpedo, which is over 18 feet long, went through a special development. You see these wooden fins when they're, for this illustration, they are um, clear wood. When they are actually put on the, the uh, torpedoes on the way to Pearl Harbor and they're all fixed, that, they, that was all painted silver. Next slide. So the shallow water torpedo was a highly explosive torpedo. And you can see the warhead here. One of the problems they wanted to make sure of this, the, the detonation. So the triggering device is right there. You can see it at the bottom, that, at that kind of object drawn right there is a triggering device. And that's the casing and the base plate for that to, uh, once it slams in, it it, it, it's, it's already armed. And when it leaves, that, uh, leaves the aircraft it, it, as a torpedo propeller spins, it's arming it. And then when it hits the side of the ship, that this will detonate. Next slide. This is the, the thing that they had to work out. They knew the British had done it. Well, they were not going to hang a wire on their planes. They had no idea. They had no knowledge of really what, how the British had done it at Toronto. So they developed a special uh, test with these type of wooden fins. I was lucky enough in 1991 to meet one of the technicians that worked on this. We had just pulled up a torpedo that's in the museum, and that torpedo, uh, when he saw it, it was like he was going back in time. And I was with Bob Cheno, with the museum curator at the time, and we went over with him all these little details. 
And it was amazing that we had met somebody that worked on this torpedo. You can see the photograph off to the left, or rather off to the right, and that's also wooden fins attached to that. Now you're asking yourself, well, what is that? And we'll go to the next slide. That what you see are the the anti-roll rudder fins. And you didn't want the torpedo to roll at all because it didn't control in a, in a straight line. If the tor it, torpedo is upright, the pitch up attempt pushes the nose down. So this keeps the torpedo level and keeps it at the depth where they want it to run, which for the Japanese, they want it to be at least 15 to 20 feet. Next slide. So from the stabilizing rudders that we now see the finished product of the torpedo, as you see it right there. So you can see the, the strength of the TNT that's placed in there. This is a torpedo that's nearly 18 feet long. And this torpedo can move through the water over 20 miles per hour. Next slide. This tells you something that I, when I was preparing for this, this talk with you today, I went and I found this document that talks about the modification and production of the torpedoes. When they started working on these torpedoes, they barely got the torpedoes to the, uh, the ships uh, that were leaving for uh, Pearl Harbor on the Hawaii operation. So you can see in the latter months of September 31, they, they needed to have well over 40 torpedoes minimum. So they were getting those torpedoes to them, but they had needed to have enough for the entire fleet. So you can see what that production was. Next slide. And these are the torpedoes. They are sitting on the deck. You'll note this is up at uh, the Kuril Islands in, in Hitakapu Bay. And you can see the fleet surrounded. This will be the, spec the attack force that will leave for Hawaii. These torpedoes are on deck. They'll take them below deck and apply as they move towards Hawaii, the wooden fins. Incredible photo, by the way. Next slide. This is the aircraft that will take it. Unlike the fairy swordfish, it, it has some similar traits, but first of all, it's single wing monoplane. It does have the trait of having three people in it, but a possibility of three. Remember, the British pulled out the center man or observer and they put a fuel tank in there. This aircraft is one of the finest aircraft in the world at that time. It can also, besides being a torpedo plane, this Nakajima B5N2, nicknamed later the Kate, this particular aircraft is the finest naval aircraft at that time. This plane would uh, also carry this bomb. It, it would double as a torpedo bomber, of which there would be 40 of those, and then horizontal bombers. And so the horizontal bomber, they had to develop this bomb. Now this bomb is impressive. It's nearly eight feet in length. And uh, this particular bomb is actually a naval shell, 16 inch, and they've put it on a lathe and they ferret it down so it is more aerodynamic. You can see the triggering device right below it and you can see these fins attached to it. It is meant to be dropped from 10,000 feet. It's an 800 kilogram bomb. And, it's, it, and that model is a Mark V. Next slide. This is the Japanese Naval or Ordnance. So, so this thing is huge. The torpedo itself on the, that uh, Kate aircraft was almost three quarters of the length of the plane. So you're now carrying this 800 kilogram bomb, almost the same weight as a torpedo, nearly a, almost a ton. Next slide. The man they've chosen to lead the attack is this very capable flight leader. Um, he will uh, be obsessive about studying about how to do this attack, how the bases will be suppressed. He worked along with another intelligence officer and, and uh, military planner, uh, Manur Genda. Next slide. Training took place for the attack in, in the southern part of Japan near Kagoshima. And these were the training colors for the planes. They would be painted dark gray, uh, green like you saw in the previous, and they were practicing the drops for the uh, shallow water torpedo. The training was intensive. The pilot himself would have to take the plane down to approximately 25 to 30 feet 
about 10 meters and then release the torpedo. And they, they had a lot of problems getting the planes and the torpedo to react and the final modifications allowed them to have the kind of success that they would have at Pearl Harbor, but it was hard work. The other special weapon, we've talked about now two of them. We've talked about the, the, the uh, horizontal bomber and the torpedo bomber and the development of those armaments was the addition of this midget submarine, which was 80 feet long. Now you can see the inside of the submarine, the basic control area for the uh, two submariners inside. You can see you have, you have a person that is steering the, the sub, keeping it at different levels. It's all electric powered. It has about roughly about 16 to 17 hours of power. And um, you can see forward in orange color are two torpedoes, the same types of torpedoes that are carried by the carrier aircraft. You can see a periscope that they use. And then you can see right here, you can see that um, this is how it's gonna be carried from Japan to the offshore Honolulu. And they were about 12 miles out. The mother submarine is an I-class submarine. And you can see that it's held on the back of the submarine. They will go submerge, release it uh, a few miles away from Pearl Harbor and on its way to get in through the harbor entrance, sit on the harbor bottom when the raid starts, rise up and start torpedoing ships that are available. Next slide. The fleet gathered uh, in the Kuriles in northern Japan. This photograph shows one of the aircraft carriers and the support battleships and cruisers there. Next slide. And they will depart. The flight leader, here he is. This is Mitsuo Fuchida on the carrier Kagi, and they're getting ready to leave on their mission. They left on November 26, and the fleet caught instantly as it got out into the northern Pacific, you can see how rough the seas were. That's why they, uh, many people thought that this couldn't be done because it's, no one would leave and cover 4,000 miles to come to Oahu. Who would do that? And in those heavy seas, they would do that. On Friday, December uh, uh, 5th at 10 a.m., the USS Arizona is one of the ships that's being brought in to moor at Foxtrot F7 South and North as the tugs pull her in. This will be the last mooring of the Arizona and there will be seven battleships along Battleship Row. Next slide. There was a quick briefing of all the pilots before they took off. Everybody had been highly trained, knew what they needed to do. They made their last prayers down below, perhaps a cut of their hair and their fingernails and were placed in an envelope to be sent back to the family should they be killed in the attack. But these pilots were razor sharp and all their crew members as well, ready to deliver these special weapons. Next slide. The first contacts occurred uh, on this particular event at 6.30 and 7.02. 6.30 would be a submarine contact, 7.02 would be the radar contact. So those played a role. This dispatch that you see here was sent to the commands on November 27th. This is the famous war warning that Kimmel and Short got, uh, telling them to uh, take appropriate measures against sabotage and to, uh, because of the destabilization conditions, and to make ready for a war warning and have be on guard. Next. That incident at uh, 6.30 in the morning included this midget submarine that made contact uh, with a destroyer that was called in after Do this submarine you, was followed. Yes. Yeah. Are you still there, Daniel? Yes. I'm here. Next slide. Amanda, did we lose you? 
Okay, um, Daniel, we do have a lot of questions already. Do you want to start answering some questions while we wait? Sure. Okay. All right, so I'll help facilitate that. Um, okay, thank you. Let me stop the screen share so I can see. Uh, Amanda? So, um, okay. I don't know what happened because I tried to take over when you lost audio and then it kicked me out. Okay. So let me let me get on the phone and figure this out. Okay. We can go we'll do questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. I just heard from Amanda. We're trying to get this fixed. So. Okay. Um, so we are going to go right into um, questions uh, for Daniel. So uh, we have a question from um, Eric. Eric, I'm going to unmute you, and you can ask your question for Daniel. Go ahead and ask your question. Eric, can you hear us? All right, well, Eric's question was, did the high-level bombers all approach from the same direction? What was the approach of these bombers? Well, actually, those are the next slides coming up. I have the, all of those uh, in a uh, map form showing the lineup. But since we don't have the visual right now, I just wanted to let you know that the planes would uh, fly down the coastline of the Waianae coastline, which is the Waianae Mountains on the shore side of that, and they would break in an air group as the torpedo planes and horizontal bombers came down that coastline. The torpedo planes turned over what is present day Barbers Point, Makakilo area. The horizontal bombers flew out to sea to gain more altitude, about five miles. They knew the torpedo attack had to get its job done. They knew that a job would take about probably 10 to 15 minutes, no more. And then they would come back and line up right over the island, coming over again, part of EVA, and then moving themselves right in line with battleship room. It was a train of aircraft in a five pattern of five planes, lead plane at the point, two on, and echelon on either side. Uh, we have a question for Paul. Oh, you're unmuted. Can you hear us? <coughs> go, go ahead and ask a question, Paul. Um, okay, I, I don't know if he can uh, hear us. Um, I can so, hear you guys. I can't hear the question. Yeah, uh, so he typed his question. He wanted to know what were the qualities of the fairly swordfish that made it particularly effective at the Battle of Toronto? Well, the Ferry Sorceress was an extremely stable aircraft. It was a bi-wing aircraft, and it had been in action in the conditions in the North Sea of, of uh, you know, in, in uh, the Atlantic are terrible. And remember, they were in an engagement. For those of you who don't know, they were in an engagement to hunt down the Bismarck. And these torpedo planes made sorties against the Bismarck and eventually hit the Bismarck's rudder, which... Um, they had sustained some damage along the hull, but the rudder fixed that. It couldn't fix that, that rudder. And I say when it fixed that, in other words, it was fixed. It, was, it, was, it could not turn. And so the Bismarck was now going around in circles. The British fleet now could come in. They were, they told that, they were told that it appears that they had damaged the Bismarck. She's now turning in circles. Well, the, the British um, officers aboard their ship knew what that problem was. They were well aware that they had done some lethal damage to it and they closed in and sank the Bismarck. Now the question result, what is the importance of, this, of those airplanes? The airplanes were extremely capable. And think about the, what they did. They took off about a two hour flight to Toronto, made their way there, and then the two of the planes went above and dropped flares to light it up. And these guys came in and were able to be nimble enough with that aircraft to zigzag the barrage balloons because if they ran into those wires, that, that was the end of that trip. And then get down to the altitude they needed to to drop that torpedo and then scamper away. And so an airplane that has pretty good speed, but a lot of, of maneuverability, that made that particular plane um, effective and, and uh, lethal. The Japanese had a much different aircraft that was had good speed, but it had a lot of stability. So when it came down to 25 to 30 feet to drop its torpedo, that pilot 
was had trained to keep that plane stable so that the torpedo could be dropped. And when the torpedo dropped and hit the water, those wooden fins exploded away. They broke away, but they broke the fall of the torpedo and it now splashed in the water, went down maybe 15 to 20 feet, leveled off, and then ran. So there was no way that the normal torpedo without those fins, or without the wire attached to it like the British, that torpedo would need 95 feet to, to come up. Well, they would have plunged in the mud at Toronto, they would plunge into the mud at Pearl Harbor. So the development of that torpedo with the wooden fins or the swordfish with the wire that snapped and broke the fall and belly flopped that, that torpedo, that kind of military science applied made that special weapon lethal and effective. Andy, Andy B. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. What's your question? Hey, Daniel, how are you? Thank you very much. Well, I uh, wish I was in better shape with my program. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be worse. You could be enjoying the weather in Chicago. So uh, I love here's Chicago. a question. Uh, it's a great town. Here's a question for you. Did uh -huh. they ever reach a consensus regarding responsibility for why the anti-torpedo nets were not installed in Pearl uh, based on what everyone knew had happened at Toronto? What, was it because of Washington or no, did uh, you know, the command it, it, it's, do that? It, it, it's certainly, you know, you, it, it, then you get into the whole conspiracy theory stuff, which is nonsense. But you ask a very good question. Now, keep in mind, that the Italians had anti torpedo nets and they didn't put it up because they couldn't envision uh, them dropping torpedoes because they have 35 feet of water. They, they just were comfortable that torpedoes couldn't be effective there. But they did have anti torpedo nets, they just didn't pull them out. The same for the United States Navy. We had anti torpedo nets and they just thought, you know, there's it, that's, it takes a lot of time to put them up, but the the mindset was that Kimmel thought the war would break out, the fleet would sail out, we, they, he would have in his hand War Plan Orange and begin executing it with a fleet engagement. Well, the Japanese weren't going along with that. They were going on with the idea, well, will you use these, this technology, these special weapons to defeat that? And on top of that, we're gonna take away their air power from the outset. So, to answer your question, I, I think I have, but I, I want to insist that people made decisions based on the best information they had. That's a responsibility command. Did Kimmel make the right decisions? Yes and no. But that, if you, one of the things we love to do in history is second guess and a what if. All we know is he wanted those bows turned towards the harbor. So when you look at Battleship Row, you'll note that all the bows are turned towards the harbor entrance. He wanted that fleet to be able to sortie quickly and get out and get moving. That's why all the ships were topped off in full fuel. They had their armaments aboard. They were ready to go if they needed to go. So in that sense, he prepared for the war that he thought was going to happen. He didn't prepare for the attack that was gonna unfold. To think that Japan would sail over 4,000 miles undetected and levy an attack of hundreds of aircraft would be unthinkable. But it wasn't unthinkable to Billy Mitchell. He predicted it. You see, there was two trains of thought in, that, in our country at that time. Those that believed in air power and those that believed in sea power. And they struggled for budgets. They struggled for philosophy and ended in disaster. Yeah, I've really been like that. Yeah. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes left, so we'll do about 10 more minutes of questions before we let you go. We have uh, John in Washington, D.C. John, can you hear us? I sure can, can you hear me? Yes, go Gotta ahead. Gotta be John McCaskill. <laughs> yes, sir, hey, Dan. Hey, man, great Mark, job as usual. Hey, well, man. I'm sorry, that we'll, we'll get another shot at this because I had have some great stuff, so. We'll do it. I, I just feel sorry for all of PHP people that supported this and we did a lot of work. We'll, get, we'll be back. So here's my question. Um, sure. 
understanding that the Arizona was hit by two horizontal bombers, the second mm-hmm. one killing it. I saw a documentary, and I guess it was prematurely put out, but it had a torpedo going underneath the vessel and compromising the keel of the Arizona. That could not have happened, could it? Well, I'll never say it couldn't have happened, but there's no report of a torpedo um, striking the Arizona. Now, I was part of a team when I was diving on the Arizona for the Park Service that explored the hull. Uh, Brett Seymour was involved and others from the Navy's, uh, rather from the Park Service teams along with some Navy teams. And we looked for any, um, what there, there's ripples that it occurs when a torpedo strikes. It ripples the metal. And uh, you can see pictures of the battleships that were hit, like the, the um, Oklahoma when it got in and the California, you could see this rippling effect, which it takes all those plates and just that tremendous explosion does that. There's nothing like that on the port side of the Arizona, none at all, and none on the starboard side. And we explored it from stem to stern, and you just couldn't see any of that. So um, some of the survivors have, uh, of the Arizona thought that a torpedo had hit the ship, but there was no evidence of it. And some of them, you know, the, the the battleships ahead of them, one of them uh, exploded right in the, the stern of the ship. So it, if you're on the ship and you see that the ships are so close, it could have been misinterpreted. But as far as we know to this day, we have no evidence of a torpedo strike on the Arizona. Question from Jaden. Uh, you are unmuted, friend. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to tell you first, thank you for doing this. It sucks a bit that it bugs, but honestly, you have like one of my dream jobs, like getting to work at Pearl Harbor and all about history. And yeah, my question was, uh, I can find it. Were there some things when you're working that you found out that made you go, seriously, this happened and stuff that got you like super mad? Would you repeat that again? There was, was there what? Like some stuff that really surprised you when you were learning about everything. I think I'm surprised every day. Um, I, I, um, I'll give you an example. I mean, um, my professor, uh, uh, Dr. Holter and, and uh, Dr. Judson Grenier, where I went to school at California State University of Dominguez Hills, they were wonderful professors, and I remember one lecture that was given, and it says, the more you know, the less you know. And that's certainly true with Pearl Harbor, because uh, I learn something almost every day if I'm doing research, and I just ran across, uh, I'm, I'm right now um, putting together a paper on how did this memorialization of Pearl Harbor start? What was the first time that they took a a uh, moment aside to actually memorialize the USS Arizona and the Pearl Harbor attack. And that was in 1950 on December 7th. Well, I was going down these digital wormholes and I found this document that not only told what happened at the ceremony, but who was there. And in fact, one of the uh, guests at this December 7th ceremony in 1950 where the plaque that's on the USS Arizona Memorial today was installed on this platform on the ship's boat deck. One of the families were there and they had lost both of their sons, two brothers died. And so, and, and it has in that document, every movement that was done for that commemoration. And I just couldn't believe it. And I, it was a newspaper clipping that I was looking for something totally different but I was associated with that memorial plaque, and there it was. So the more you know, the less you know. Uh, we have uh, Nicholas has a really interesting question. We'll call you uh, two or three more questions. Uh, Nicholas, go ahead and ask your question. Nicholas, can you hear us? 
All right, so I think you might have technical difficulties. Uh, <laughs> we can uh, go on to our next question from Peter. Peter, I will go ahead and unmute you. Peter, can you hear us? Peter. All right. Um, yeah, Peter got it. Yeah, so it, let me try again. Peter, can you hear us? All right, Peter is having some uh, difficulty. Uh, Marie, I will try one last one and then I will read the question for her. But this was a very interesting one I was um, kind of thinking myself. Uh, Marie, go ahead and ask your question. I, I, I had two. First, what, was there any kind of revenge against the Japanese consulate in Honolulu after Pearl Harbor? like there was in Washington, I thought you said at the beginning. And secondly, was all the Japanese consulate, so in Honolulu, aware of the attack that was coming or not? Um, the first question, was there any, I, I suspect any violence or protests uh, at, the, uh, at the embassy in Washington, DC, and did that take place at the consulate here in um, Hawaii, in Honolulu? Um, there were protests, people gathered outside the embassy in Washington. As you can imagine, this attack was by surprise, and the newspapers were calling it a sneak attack. These are, in those days, more so than today, uh, attacking somebody without a declaration of war would be considered outrageous and shameful. In the Japanese culture at that time, um, they had done a surprise attack on the Russian fleet in 1904, so at Port Arthur. So um, when you're engaged in war, you try to take the advantage. Um, trying to build a moral system into it is difficult. But in this particular case, uh, here uh, when the attack took place, it became uh, a reference point for to remember Pearl Harbor. Overt racism was used during the war to typify the Japanese as rats and all kinds of things. Uh, but Pearl Harbor, uh, uh, there was uh, the posters are incredible that were done to elicit emotion from the American people to defeat the Japanese. Um, as far as um, uh, protests, there's none that I know of in Honolulu, but immediately the FBI descended on the consulate because the Japanese uh, were burning, uh, the, the consular officers were burning their papers, which everybody does, by the way, that wasn't unusual, but that's what you do. You get rid of the official papers because you know you're going to be, it's good, the uh, embassy or consulate is going to be uh, generally occupied. Uh, no one knew that the Japanese by Tokeo Yoshikawa uh, that was there, except the Council General, Council General Kita. He knew what was going on. And, um, and so they were joyous when they heard the rumblings of the bombing coming from Pearl Harbor. But they remember from their perspective, this was their country and, um, and now they were at war. Uh, the Council General, and all of his staff were later taken from the consulate here in Honolulu uh, and later uh, repatriated back to Japan. And it's interesting that the spy, Takeo Yoshikawa, was never found out. They just thought he was a counselor officer. And so he was repatriated to Japan. And um, he had, you know, the kind of pride that he had done such a great job for the Japanese Navy. But when he, the war is over, no one wants to hear about it. No one heard about it during the war. He remained that silent um, spy and, uh, and his whole life was one of regret. He did come to Pearl Harbor. He was invited by Walter Cronkite on the 20th anniversary in 1961. And he told his story right here in Pearl Harbor. And his final kind of his final words were, I held history in my hand. Um, we have uh, our final question. We'll come from Gavin. Gavin, um, you are unmuted. Gavin, can you hear us? 
Yes, I can. What's up, Gavin? Hi. So uh, this is, I'm actually really excited. That I'm a huge Pearl Harbor fan. So um, my question was, how long did it take the Japanese to plan the Pearl Harbor raid? Well, that's an interesting question. The, the Japanese, um, a year before, were mulling over the idea. When I say the Japanese, that's a Japanese Navy. They were mulling over the idea of a possibility of attack on Pearl Harbor. In fact, in the program, I have one of Yamamoto's quotes in it. But he wondered, after seeing these reports from Onishi and others, uh, Onishi was one of the uh, one of the naval officers that developed some of the plans and and uh, brought this information. There were lectures done at the, their war college. Uh, they have a naval war uh, <clears throat> academy, and they had lectures being done there. And one of them was by one of the officers that went down to Toronto, saw what happened, talked to the Italians about how did this occur, put that all together, and then made a report to the Japanese Navy, and then came back to um, to the uh, their, you know Japan's Naval Academy at, at Tajima, and we're, they were giving lectures on this. And so this fell upon. Uh, Mitsu Fuchida, who will lead the attack on Pearl Harbor, and Minura Genda, who will plan it. Those were people I introduced earlier. And they then started formulating the idea about a year before. I wonder if we can do this. And then the, the object of my program is, yeah, we can do it, but how are we going to do it? We got, do we have the aircraft to do it? Do we have the weapons to do it? How does the Pacific fleet array itself? How will we hit the inboard ships? Can we have an alternative attack with midget submarines? So they went into all of this planning and that's how they developed special weapons, the high level bomb, the shallow water torpedo, the midget submarine and tactics. Remember all of these things don't work unless you have good tactics, proper planning, and a lot of training. And so when, if you think of the Japanese aviator in 1941, in December of 1941, you are looking at some of the best pilots that have ever flown to take care of this mission. They were, they were excellent. And I remember I interviewed one of the pilots uh, that, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. I'm sorry, I just missed it. But it, it, no matter, I'll think of it later. And I'll, but this, this pilot, I asked him what, what, what was the most difficult thing about that? And he, he said the training. And I said, the training? He said, yes, uh, they, they, they did so many things to us that, that we needed to achieve. And he was a torpedo pilot. And he said, uh, one of the things when you become a pilot, you get used to that because he used to put us in the water for like eight hours treading water to see who was the toughest. And uh, in, that, in Japan, the water's a little cold there. So, you know, that, that, and so this particular pilot said he, when he made his run on the USS Oklahoma, he said that he had probably eight to 10 seconds to get everything proper. In other words, lower the plane to 30 feet, make sure that he's got his target lined up, release a torpedo, then fly above the ship, not to avoid colliding with it. And uh, when he, he said that, after he looked back and, and uh, the rear gunner uh, was watching as they flew over and saw the explosion, the water geysers went up nearly 90 feet in the air. And he said he, they had a direct hit. And he thought to himself, wow, now I can die. In other words, he had accomplished his mission. Anything after that, he was prepared for.